You know, I really believe that uh, there are prophetic moments and in history. I think that this last week is a prophetic moment that a clock, a timepiece is ticking and God wants to do something supernatural in our nation, in our church that brings him glory. Remember, we've been studying training to reign. We're in the series called Train to Reign. And it's taken from the scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, where Paul writes, he says, So I run with purpose in every step. In other words, God calls us to be intentional in the steps that we, we take. I'm not just shadow boxing, not just beating the air. I discipline my body like an athlete, training my body to do what it should do. Now, I ran the park run on Saturday, so if you heard an earthquake in Mbaban as I was running up there, <laughs> I, I ran and I walked rather. <laughs> it was tough because when you're out of shape and you're trying to get back into shape running, it's painful to train your body to do what it ought to do, isn't it? But if you recognize there's something that you have to do, then you've got to keep pushing through. And last week, Pastor Kurt taught us the discipline of taking Holy Communion, where the anointing, the grace, and the love of God is to encourage you to continue in Holy Communion. But today, I want us to consider this scripture in Romans 8, verse 14. A, a training that I believe that God would have us really look at today. Romans 8, verse 14. The scripture says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, as many that are led by the Holy Spirit, these are the sons of God. I believe that most of us in this room need to get to a place where we learn and train ourselves to recognize the Holy Spirit, to hear the Holy Spirit, and to let him lead us. Those who are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. I don't know about you, but so often my flesh leads me instead of the Spirit of God. You know, when there's a broken relationship or a tense relationship, it's easier to withdraw than allow the Holy Spirit to use you to reconcile. It's easier to stand off rather than push in. I believe God wants us to learn to let him lead us and lead our flesh, that our flesh comes in submission to the Spirit because the Word of God says those who sow to the Spirit reap in the Spirit everlasting life, but those who sow to the flesh reap destruction. And so this morning's message is this, serve led by the Holy Spirit, training ourselves to be led by the Spirit. Now, every one of us is wired by God to lead. And every one of us is wired by God to serve. The world says that we need to be in charge and in control and lead from the front and, 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 and lead, be the big leader. The world defines success as you're the leader. And so there's this conflict and it's the conflict of the flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. We see this, as Paul says in Galatians 5, where we're trying to say to ourselves, okay, if I lead, I lead, but what do you mean I'm supposed to serve? And I want to just pause as well for a moment and recognize that every one of us here is a leader. Some of you might be saying, but I'm not, but I can remind you what Bill Hybels teaches. He says, Every one of us is supposed to lead ourselves. So first and foremost, we're supposed to lead ourselves. So if you've got no one to lead, there is one person, yourself, where you bring your flesh in submission to the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about how every one of us is supposed to lead up. Even Jesus led up where he met with the Father and went before the Father to speak to the Father, to hear from the Father. Every one of us is to lead up. Even the Holy Spirit comes to give you the mind of Christ. He leads up. And you're called to lead up. 
You're called to lead up and lead yourself. You're also called to lead laterally. God calls us to lead those who are besides us just by being role models. And every one of us at some point in time have got people to lead that are leading down. In other words, there's somebody younger than you who's watching you to be a role model. The scripture says this, let the older woman in church train the younger woman. Let the older men in church train the younger men. But it goes further that even at a 10 years old, you're a role model for those who follow you, even in school. And so we're all leaders. But how do we lead and serve where we're led by the Spirit of God? Jesus demonstrated this, didn't he? Even in the servant leadership model at the Passover meal where he got down on his feet to wash the disciples' feet. He took off his robes, washed the disciples' feet, and he stood up and he said, this is the way to lead. It takes discipline of our bodies to serve. And even more discipline of our bodies and our heart and mind to serve with the right heart. I don't know if you've ever worked in a hotel. I had the privilege of working in the hotel for my father. And sometimes some of those customers, when they come into the hotel, they are hangry. Do you know what hangry is? Hungry and angry. (laughs) And you start looking after a person who's hangry by serving them. And you find, whoa, some people can be rude. The heart of God is that we do serve even though people are rude. You know, on Thursday, Helen and I had uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, sorry, no, Wednesday and Thursday, I'll get it right. Wednesday and Thursday, Helen and I had the privilege of attending a church conference in South Africa where there were over 500 pastors that got together. It was amazing, two days. And these pastors came from all denominations and uh, fellowshipping, just pressed into the presence of God. And on Wednesday night, Pastor Chris Matabella, who's been here, preached and uh, leading through crisis, a phenomenal message, inspiring. In fact, it was so good. If you get a chance to go online and look at it, please please do. But uh, as he was preaching to the 500 pastors, at the end of it, there was a standing ovation uh, to what the Lord was doing in his message. But in his message, he talked about the sinking of the Titanic, a prophetic moment. It was an exceptionally powerful message. Um, so powerful that I paused for a moment and I said, okay, I better need to, I need to research the Titanic again. And I went back to study the sinking of the Titanic, what ships were around and who was around. And I, was, I just felt like the Lord was trying to teach me something to share for you about being led by the Spirit of God. And I found something amazing, something I didn't know. On uh, April the 14th, 1912, we all know that the Titanic sunk. Uh, When the Titanic started sinking after it hit the iceberg, it sent out distress signals. And then from the distress signals, it sent out flares. And I don't know if you know, because I didn't know, there was a ship that was nearby. It was within seven miles. Tell your neighbor, wake up seven miles. There was a ship there called the Samson, and it was within seven miles of the Titanic, appropriately named Samson. Anyways, the Samson, seven miles from the Titanic, was a steam-powered schooner. And this ship was out there illegally hunting seals. When they saw the signals shoot off and the flares and heard the distress signals, The ship, which was captained by Carl Schung, turned the ship and headed off in the opposite direction because they didn't want to be caught having been hunting illegally the seals. I was thinking about that and thinking how often this actually represents many of us, that sometimes we're doing something that's wrong and we're in the flesh, and when the flares of distress and the signals go out that somebody needs help, instead of pressing in to serve, because we're in the flesh and in the wrong place and don't want to be discovered because we've been doing something corrupt, we pull away. We run as fast as we can rather than to jump in and serve. Let's be honest. How many of us have been like that before? Had a bad hair day, and the next thing is, 
there isn't a whole lot of love flowing. There was another ship called the Californian. It was 14 miles away from the Titanic. It was led by Captain Stanley Lord. And uh, the captain and the crew saw the flares and saw the lights flashing, distress signals of lights. And the problem was that the ship was held in a place where there were a lot of icebergs. And the captain saw the icebergs, the circumstances were against him. He saw the lights and he communicated to his crew, don't worry, that's just the ship is having a party. Those lights that are flashing, the flares, that are going, it's just a party. And so they stayed and cruised on in the different direction. The whole ship, it's recorded that the, cap, the whole crew kind of try to calm themselves just to tell themselves it's just a party, it's just a party, and carried on sailing. They sailed away. 54 miles away, there was another ship, and this ship is called the Carpathia. It was headed in a different direction, sorry, 58 miles away. And they heard the distress cries over the radio, and as they heard these distress cries, the captain of the Carpathia, Captain Arthur Rostrum, he recognized that there was real distress 58 miles away in a different direction. He looked out and he saw the icebergs and realized this is dangerous. But what he did, and it's recorded historically that he fell to his knees and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? He immediately got up and commanded that the ship turn around and pushed the ship to traveling more than 17 knots, well above its quoted maximum speed. He pushed the ship as hard as he could. And three and a half hours later, he arrived at the scene. In the three and a half hours leading up to the scene, he got the whole ship awake, alive, on the, on the, on the board, and he designated every one of them jobs to get ready to serve the passengers as they would be pulled out of the ocean. He gave everyone a job on the ship. When they arrived, they saved 705 lives as they pulled them up, 705 lives. When he looked back, he's recorded as saying, when he looked back at the icebergs and the path and the 17 knots that they'd done, he recorded as saying, it's as if somebody else's hands had been at the helm of the ship and steered them through the icebergs to the Titanic. To me, the Carpathia is like a ship that represents those who surf meeting the need without worrying about the conditions nor waiting for favorable circumstances. But if the other ships had come as well, it's said that all 1,517 could have been saved. The 705, the 1,517 could have been saved. None of these three ships were in a comfortable place to respond to lead by serving. Can I put it to you? When the captain fell on his knees, he wasn't in a comfortable place. He recognized the circumstantial dilemma. He recognized the danger. When Holy Spirit leads us, it's not always comfortable. And today, flares are being shot up around the nation across the world. People are in distress. Signals, distress signals are being fired off. The church, the potter's wheel, us as a family, we need to do better to get out of the building and reach people more often, deeper, with greater love. I believe we need to be like the Carpathia where we fall to our knees and ask Holy Spirit to lead us to serve. He needs to lead us, not our flesh. We can't be like the Samson, and we can't be like the California ship. We need to be like the Carpathia. 
And as I say that, I, I introduce that as a story because I believe that God would have us recognize prophetically there's these prophetic moments and those ships were prophetic moments, prophetic signals. And we, we're seeing this prophetic moment right now. The first is to recognize every one of us is wired to serve. We are wired to serve. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, we are wired to serve? I mean, if you think about it, we're made in God's image. And one of the names that he gives the Holy Spirit is the comforter, the counselor, the guide, the teacher. If we're made in God's image, then surely if the Holy Spirit is in us, God will use us because rivers of living water will flow out of us. That's his promise. Use us to comfort others, to teach others, to guide others. And then he'll use others to comfort us, teach us, to guide us. The problem is that most of us are a little bit like the Samson and a little bit like the California ship where we've been so hurt or we've, we've got focused on feeding our own flesh and trying to secure ourselves financially, secure ourselves emotionally, secure ourselves with strength. And, and it's important to have boundary lines. But some people have got to the place where they say, I love God, it's just his people I battle with. I love God, but I battle with his people. So many would say, so I've got no problem serving God, I just got a problem serving his hangry people. I've learned you can't serve God except by serving his children. In fact, in Acts 17, 24, the scripture says, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he's the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. Let me say it again. We can't serve God except by serving his people. That's exactly what Jesus was te teaching his disciples when he took off his robe and washed the feet of the disciples and stood up. And he says, this is how I want you to lead, servant leadership. Lead by serving. That's why Jesus says, I don't want you to lord it over the others as the Gentiles have. I don't want you to boss people around as the Gentiles bossed people around. In Matthew 20, verse 26, he continues and he says, it shall not be so amongst you. You won't boss people around, lord it over people, but you, whoever would be great amongst you must first be your servant. And whoever would be first amongst you must be your slave. Even as the son of man himself came not to be served, Jesus didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. If God called us to follow Jesus, if God tells us that Jesus is our role model and we see servant leadership, then we are wired called to serve. God wired us to serve, to serve him by serving his people. You should hear, as a pastor, you should hear some of the excuses I get to hear of why people shouldn't serve. You know, I'll serve anyone, just not him. <laughs> Two of the most popular excuses people use for not serving is this. I don't have the time. I'm too busy, I don't have the time. I just don't have the time. How much time do you have? You have 24 hours in a day, and we all have the same amount of time. We all have 24 hours. Tell your neighbor, you have 24 hours. I think we need to get real with each other. I don't think it's we don't have enough time. I think the truth is, it's not your priority to serve. I'm not trying to heap condemnation. I want to be real. 
It's not that we don't have time to serve, it's that it's not our priority to serve. And yet God is calling us in these end times, I believe, to train our bodies, to discipline our bodies like an athlete, to serve him by serving his children. But we need to know who to serve, when to serve, and how to serve. We need to discipline our bodies to know when, who, and how to serve. The second excuse that's a common excuse is this, I just don't have the talent. I don't have the talent, I don't have the ability to do what's expected of me. So because I don't have the talent and I don't have the ability, I can't serve in the way that you want me to serve. If you're called to serve in children's church, maybe you don't feel like you've got the skills to serve in children's church. But you know what? God isn't looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. That's what he's looking for, your availability. I mean, listen to Moses in Exodus 4.10. He's talking to the Lord, and the Lord's called him to go and speak, to speak to the people of Israel that are in Egypt. And so Moses pleaded with the Lord. He said, oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you've now spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. I I can't do this. By the way, I just want to let you know, when God called me into ministry, I said the same. I said, Father, I can't speak. I get so anxious. I get tongue-tied. And the Lord said, I'm not looking for your ability. I'm looking for your obedience, your availability. Will you let me anoint you? So it's not you, it's me. So I want you to know it's a miracle I'm standing up here talking. In school, I used to have to take these little pink tablets because I was so nervous as I sat at the back of the boarding school, take these pink tablets because every time the teacher looked at me, I'd start shaking and get nervous. You know, that guilty feeling. And yet I was completely innocent. I allowed fear to shape me and mold me. And the last thing in the world I wanted to do is ever talk. I was that person, the mouse hiding at the back, looking down as soon as the teacher looked at me. But look what God has done to put me up here this morning to speak. (laughs) It's not my strength. So Moses says, how can I do this? And God turns to Moses and he says, Moses, who made your mouth? Moses, I will speak through you. I will teach you what you should say. In other words, Moses, my Holy Spirit will fill you. My Holy Spirit will counsel you. My Holy Spirit will train you. My Holy Spirit will equip you. My Holy Spirit will give you gifts of the Spirit. And so this morning, let's recognize we're all wired to serve the Lord. You are wired to serve. But in that, let's recognize Holy Spirit is the one who's to empower us to serve. Because God's not looking for your ability. He's looking to anoint your availability. He's looking for your availability. It's so crucial to recognize that God is calling us to serve by serving people who have a need that God has defined. Where God tells you what wisdom to share, what understanding to share, what grace to share, what love to share. But we've got to be able to train ourselves to hear Holy Spirit. I remember when the Holy Spirit called me into ministry, I was so terrified. You see, the Lord started by calling me to work with children that were on the street that were filled with glue and taking drugs. And I was like, Lord, how can I help them get off drugs? Because I've never taken drugs. And I've got good news for you. I've never taken drugs still. (laughs) I've never taken drugs. So how can I help a person who's addicted to heroin or addicted to cocaine? How can I help a person when I've never experienced that myself. Hey, and the Lord said this. He said, Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, to set at freedom those who are oppressed. In other words, God is the one who anoints you and by the way, I learned this. I learned that people who are addicted, even though they, they use excuses, the people who are addicted, that you don't need to study what they're hooked on. You need to study on what the solution is. And the solution is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He's the way, He's the truth, and He's the life. The focus is on Him and His grace 
and His anointing. He does it all. We're just to show up and be available. I remember when God said, Kevin, I want you to open your home, your house, to this person who's addicted. Well, when I went home to tell Helen, Helen was very gracious and opened our home. And so I took this person into, into our house to, to help him break free of heroin. But I, I want you to know, <laughs> when I did a drug test on him, I was so naive that when I tested his uh, system for, for heroin and it came back positive, he'd, he'd somehow snuck out and got heroin. And I was saying, but, but you, you, you've just taken heroin. The guy so, was so good at speaking, so good at manipulating, that ultimately I believed his lie that this test kit was expired, even though the date said it wasn't <laughs> expired. And he was right and I was wrong. And because I didn't know anything about drugs or anything like that, I was completely wrong. Uh, you just, Kevin, mampumpan. Anyway, so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, hey, something's gone on here. I remember when one of the staff members, we were so naive, the staff member uh, was helping a heroin addict, and this heroin addict had given up his passport because passports are very valuable. Just look after your passport. Tell your neighbor, look after your passport. <laughs> For addicts, passports are very valuable, so be careful. Anyway, this guy had handed his passport over, and so this, this guy, this addict, convinced our staff member, because he was so naive, to help him to go to the drug house to allow the addict to go into the drug house and get the passport. After half an hour of being in the, in the drug house, the st staff member realized he's not going for his passport, he's going for it. <laughs> we were so naive. We realized actually the solution isn't studying the drug. The solution is studying Jesus because the addiction isn't the issue. Rejection is. Addiction is just the fruit. The root is something else. So we need to direct the roots to Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Lord told me, Kevin, you need to know how to get help from me. You need to know how to be led by me. You need to be led by the Spirit. Tell your neighbor, we need to train ourselves to be led by the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit wants to empower us. As I share that right now, Maybe you feel like the Samson and you've been steering a ship away. Maybe you feel like you're the California and you're steering away because circumstances are not perfect to surf. Circumstances will never be perfect. You know, you might feel like, hang on a second, I just need to park the ship in the harbor because that's where I'll be safe. I control my circumstances, the wind that's around me. But I want to point you to a quote. John A. Shedd said this, a ship in the harbor is safe but that is not what ships are built for. You can, you can make the circumstances safe and all the rest and control it, but that's not what you're wired for. You're wired to serve and you're wired to receive the Holy Spirit to be empowered to serve God if you let him. Revelations 22, 17 says this, and the spirit and the bride say, come. The Holy Spirit says, come. And let him who hears say, come. If you hear the word say, come. Let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I believe Holy Spirit wants to fill every one of us this morning with his spirit to empower you, to renew you, where each of us lean in on him to hear his voice, to be trained to hear his voice, to be trained to understand and operate in his grace gifts, to operate with his discernment and with his mercy, with his wisdom. I believe that's why the captain of the Carpathia, when he fell on his knees and he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He was able to get up, put the ship down to 17 knots and go straight through the icebergs. I believe that's why he was able to look back and say, it was as if somebody's hands had guided us through the icebergs. I remember the night before I got married, being so in the presence of God and saying, Father, I don't feel equipped to be a husband. And the Lord said to me, Kevin, I will anoint you to look after my daughter, Helen. I remember the night before Asher was born, I was like, Lord, I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to do this. And the Lord said, Kevin, Luke 4, 18, I'll anoint you, the spirit of the Lord, to be a father. I'll give you the father heart. I remember when Joshua was born, 
I was nervous. Lord, how can I do this? And the Lord said, Kevin, I will anoint you. I remember the day the ministry opened. I said, Lord, I don't know. But the Lord said, I will anoint you. Let me tell you this. God will anoint you if you let him anoint you. He will give you the father heart to lead through circumstances you don't know. But you've got to learn to let the Holy Spirit lead us in serving. Tell your neighbor, let the Holy Spirit lead us in serving. When you do that, he will be your comforter. He will be your counselor. He will be your guide. But let me warn you, it's very rarely a comfortable situation. In John 14, verse 16, the scripture says, Jesus said, I pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. A comforter is the word parakletus. It means somebody who comes alongside that whilst you're walking, that one who's walking alongside of us is talking to us, is training us, is equipping us, is teaching us, is counseling us, is instructing us. It was actually also used in ancient military, referring to the, the commander of the troops going up next to the soldiers and preparing them for war. As they walked to war, the troop, the commander would walk next to them, telling them what to do. The Holy Spirit is our coach, our counselor, our comforter. He's the Lord. He calls us to be available, but he coaches us as to what to do. He doesn't do it. You have to be the hands and the feet, but he fills you to enable and empower you. He's also the one that will lead us into all truth. Look at this in John 14, 17. The spirit of truth, he's referring to the Holy Spirit being truth. He will give you the truth. You can go through these icebergs. He'll give you the truth. You can be a husband. You can be a wife. He'll give you the truth. You can be a father. You can get your business right. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Just say with me, spirit of truth. The scripture also says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from my father, he will testify of me the spirit of truth. In John 16, 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak. He will tell you of things to come. He's the spirit of truth. He's not going to lie to you. He will equip you for this season. By the way, it also refers to the spirit of truth being the guide. And the the Greek word for God there is the hodego, and it means a qualified expert guide, a guide that will take you places you've never been before. The Holy Spirit guided that captain of the Carpathia through those icebergs to get to a place he'd never been before because the Holy Spirit was guiding him, and the Holy Spirit promises to be your guide. Remember the scripture said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, These are the sons of God. You can trust him. But this morning, understand that he'll lead us into places that we aren't comfortable with. Just like the Kapathia. Just like me starting in ministry where God called me into ministry where I wasn't comfortable. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was led by the Holy Spirit into the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you know he wasn't comfortable? The Bible says that he left the disciples and went a short distance and fell on his face before the Lord. The Bible tells us that he was so uncomfortable that he was in agonizing, that he literally sweated blood. He was so uncomfortable with what God was calling him to. It was the Holy Spirit that led him to the garden, led him to Pontius Pilate. It was the Holy Spirit that led him to the cross. But it was the Holy Spirit who also led him to take the keys of hell, the keys of death away from Satan and hand it back to you, the church today. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, you have the keys in Jesus' name. Now listen to this as I end in 1 Peter 4. The end of all things is at hand. I believe we're in end times. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude 
of sin. Family, we need to stay in the place of love, where we are hospital for wounded souls, where we look after the people from the Samson, we look after the people from the California, and we don't say to the people from the Samson, you ran away, you messed up to the California. And we don't say we're better off because we're the Carpathia, but we're a hospital for wounded souls where God calls us to be hospitable to one another without grumbling. That we love one another without grumbling. Then he says in verse 10, as each one of you has received a gift. Can you tell your neighbor, you have received a gift. As each one of you has received a gift, serve one another. Minister it to one another. Serve one another this gift as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, that's the word serve. If anyone serves, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. In other words, that's listening to the Spirit. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Flames, flares, distress signals are going off all around us. Do you agree with me? We see buildings burn. We see people struggling. We see people without food. We see people who are really in dire circumstances. We, the church, need to now not be like Samson, nor like California, but we need to be like the Carpathia. But that means we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to know the mind of Christ in submission to the authority of the Word of God under the leadership God gives us. And when he tells us to do something, it's always to serve his children. It's not for us to own and control. It's to serve, to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to allow ourselves to learn to be led by him. This morning, three quick things. As I, as I end this, it's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you your emotions. It's going to cost you strength. But if you recognize we are wired to surf and the Holy Spirit empowers us and refreshes us and renews us to surf, as we allow Holy Spirit to lead us to surf, he will take what was meant for bad and turn it for good. Can I ask you to stand this morning before God? And as you do, and the worship team comes up, I believe that the Lord would have every one of us allow our Holy Spirit to come and refresh and renew us, that we would be able to take the next step in, as the Lord leads, that we take the next step in the Lord. The next step is to hear Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Not our flesh, but Holy Spirit. And, and God would call us in the next step to serve. And maybe this morning, you don't know what to do, but the next step would be to connect into a local church. The next step would be to get some discipleship. The next step would be to join a life group. The next step would be to allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, to serve one another. That when you go home today and you join your family, not just to feel like, you're irritated or something has gone wrong, but to step back and say, Lord, you promised me that you would anoint me to be able to bring life, hope, and joy. I believe God is saying this morning, he's calling every one of us to shift atmospheres in our home, in our relationships, in our workplace. Can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, in Jesus' name, you are called to shift atmospheres. Amen. Can I ask you to just bow your heads? And as you do, if you recognize you need a refreshing this morning because somehow your own flares are going off, your own distress signals are going off, and you need Holy Spirit to just equip you as it did the captain of the Carpathia. Because around you, you're seeing the distress signals and you don't know how to answer. You want to carry them, but you can't. God didn't wire you to carry people. God wired you to pray for people. And you say to me, but my, my emotions, and the Lord says, don't worry, I'll fill you up. I'll renew you. Set the boundaries. This morning, if you recognize 
that you need in refreshing by the Holy Spirit. If you recognize this morning you need a renewal of the Holy Spirit, this morning you need the infilling of the Spirit. Can I ask you just to put up your hands and say, Father, that's me. I really need an infilling of the Holy Spirit. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Can you say with me, I welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come and refresh. Come and renew. Come and fill me in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I believe God is doing something significant this morning. He's saying to us that he's going to move us out of the church walls. I'm not talking about just on service. I'm talking about reaching family. I'm talking about praying for family, praying for community, that we would be a church that is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, loving one another just as he's loved us. So, Father, we come before you and we declare we love you, Lord. Your mercy never fails us. And we pause and look behind and realize that just like the Carpathia, you've guided our marriages, you've guided our families, you've guided us to where we're in this situation right now, where we are now. We need a miracle, Father. People are drowning around us. But we offer our hands and feet to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go into a time of worship, Maybe there's a family member on your mind that you could just commit to the Lord as we pray, as we worship. Please don't rush out. As we end the service today, I've asked the ministry team to be ready to be praying for you for a renewal, for a refreshing, for an infilling, that we train ourselves not to hear our flesh, but to be led by the Spirit of God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. God bless you.